So let's pick it up. We've been looking now, and uh, the, the theme really is kind of continuing what we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks. Uh, and, and, you know, it's about don't miss Canaan, don't miss your rest, don't miss what God has in store for you and all of his fullness. We, we've been hammering that, and I've pled with you uh, for two weeks now, don't miss out. God's got something so great for you, wonderful for you, and don't be like the Hebrews that because of their unbelief did not go into Canaan. They were delivered, they were saved, they made it into heaven, but while they were here, they never got in on the fullness of God. And I don't want you to be that way. So we, we, a little bit today, we're going to be looking uh, at that continued theme. I only have two points this morning. I don't get real excited about that. <laughs> Normally I'll have four or five. And you say, well, two, man, we're going to get out here in half the time. And that's not so. It's not so. Uh, but I only have two things that I want to share with you this morning around the word of God. We're looking at Hebrews and going through Hebrews. And uh, it's not a dry book. It's alive. And uh, now preachers can get dry. Can I get a witness? Be careful how you respond too much to that. But... You know, we, 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 uh, we, we do, uh, preachers get dry. I heard about an old preacher out in a rural part of the state. Uh, he was preaching outside on a particular Sunday, and a wind came along and blew his notes out into the pasture. And uh, the cow ate his notes, and the cow went dry. And, and, and I know preachers can get dry, <laughs> but the Bible never, ever gets dry. And it's more alive than we could ever imagine. I'm going to talk about that uh, in just a few minutes. Let's pick it up now, right where we left off. Verse 12, if you will, in chapter number 4. For the word of God is quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even in the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight or displayed or laid open and shown in his sight. But all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Seeing then uh, we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Uh, let, let us hold fast our profession for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The first thing I want to share with you is the ministry of the Word. The ministry of the Word. Now, I'm not just talking about Rima or a word that is specific for a person or an event. I'm also talking about uh, the written word of God. So, so let me give you four descriptions, if I could, of what the writer of Hebrews is describing to us about the word. First of all, he says that it is a pulsating word. For the word of God is Quick. That word means quick, but quick means alive. For the word of God is uh, alive. It is living. Now, when you came into the church this morning, uh, you weren't carrying a copy of Field and Stream magazine nor Golf Digest. You didn't come in today with the uh, Women's Home Journal. You came in to this place this morning carrying. The Word of God. And the reason is that you have come to believe that it is more than a bunch of ink on white paper stuck between two pieces of leather. You know that it is the inspired, infallible, inerrant, living Word of God. And so you've understood it uh, to be there. It is alive. The Bible says that it is God breathed, for it is the inspired. It is God breathed to you and to me. Isaiah chapter 55 says that that word will not come back empty, it will not return 
without substance. He's going to be there. Now, not only the word is something, uh, you have to understand that the word does something. Uh, now, it's a pulsating word. It's, a, it's alive. But notice what else. It is a penetrating word. A penetrating word. As we read the word of God, the word of God then covers uh, our life. It goes down deep into our life. Now, I don't expect everybody in here to understand this illustration, uh, but, but I believe you, you, you get an idea behind it. If you go out to your car and you pick up the hood uh, of your car and look at the motor, uh, there's a little deal with a little circle on top of it, and it's called a dipstick. Can you say that dipstick? Just say the di dipstick. Now, the dipstick goes down into the bottom of the oil pan and you pull out the dipstick and it reveals the depth by which the oil goes in your car. How much oil is there? The word of God goes down deep into the very recesses of our life and reveals the inconsistencies uh, about our life. I heard about a, a, a guy that came out of the dental uh, institute, became a dentist, and it was his very first practice. And uh, he was scheduled one morning to have the first extraction uh, that he had ever done. And so this old boy shows up to get his tooth pulled, sits down in the chair. Uh, the uh, doctor comes in, and this new doctor who's never done this before, and, and he numbs all in that area, and wait till it gets good and numb. He gets his pliers. He goes into that old fella, and he says to him, now open up wide. And so he opens up wide, and he puts those pliers on that tooth, getting ready to pull it. And as soon as the pliers grabbed hold of that tooth, that old boy locked jawed right down on those pliers. Well, he couldn't pull it like that. So finally he coaxed the guy to open his mouth. He pulled the pliers out and so he went at it again. And just as soon as he hit that tooth, locked jawed right back down on it again. He did that three or four times. And so the dentist finally said to his assistant, said, now, come on, I need to talk to you a minute. And so they went into another room and he gives the assistant a big hat pin about that long. And he says to her, now when I give you the sign, you take that hat pin and you like that right there. She knew what he meant. So they go back into the room and he opens up wide and the dentist gets the pliers on that tooth and he winks at his assistant. She takes that hat pin. <clears throat> and now, boy, ah! Dentist pulls out the tooth. Dentist looks at him and said, did that hurt? He said, yeah, but I didn't know the roots went that deep. Mm. You understand that the word of God goes deeper than psychology. The word of God goes deeper than analysis. The word of God goes deeper than group therapy can go. And all of those things have their place, but they can't take the place of the word of God that goes into the very recesses of our lives and exposes uh, who we are to who, uh, who we really are to God. And, and, and the word of God has the power to change our life. I'll never forget as long as I live. It was a snowy Sunday. There may have been 50 people in the building. May have been 50 people in this building. I don't know. But I looked over here and there was one guy I had never seen before in my life. And he came in and, and you could tell that, you know, this was a guy that was not accustomed to going to church very often. Now, mind you, get this, a snowy Sunday and I'm preaching on tithing to 50 people. Well, I didn't change the message. I just preached on tithing. I said, God, you laid this on my heart. You knew it was going to snow. You knew who was going to be here. I'm going to preach on tithing. So I preached on tithing. Gave the invitation, and that stranger got up out of his seat. Preached on tithing. Got up out of his seat and came and confessed Jesus Christ as his Lord and as his Savior and was gloriously saved. Why was that? It's the depth that the Word of God goes it is a penetrating word to the very recesses of our heart and brings us and changes us. Third, it's a pronouncing word. The Bible says it is a discerner 
of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Listen to just the phrase of that. It has discernment about your heart, has discernment about your motives. You know, sometimes you could read the word of God and you can be comforted by it. Sometimes you can read the word of God and you're going to be convicted by it. Sometimes you read the word of God and you are challenged by it. Sometimes you can read the word of God and it affirms the truths that you hold dear. Sometimes you can read the word of God and instead of saying amen, you have to say oh me. The word of God has a way of judging the inconsistencies and the behavior of my life that needs to be changed. You see, we don't judge the scripture. The scripture judges us. I've not seen the attack on the word of God in my lifetime like I am seeing the attack of the word of God today. I don't know if you saw in the news, it's so subtle. You know, it's just so subtle that if you're not careful, you just kind of overlook this stuff and you think that it is an attack on something or someone else, but when in reality, it is an attack on the Word of God. Did you see the New York Times article this week that attacked Chick-fil-A in New York City, actually attacked Chick-fil-A, and the title of the article was 17 different places that you should buy your chicken other than Chick-fil-A. Now, what were they really attacking? Were they really attacking the values of Chick-fil-A? Yeah, indirectly they were, but what directly they were attacking was the word of God that Chick-fil-A stands on. So, so you, we've got this attack. There have been many attacks on the word of God down through the centuries of time. Kings have attacked the word of God. Dictators have attacked the word of God. Philosophers have attacked the word of God. Bogus theologians have attacked the word of God. May I say that they have all gone by the way. They're not on the scene anymore, but the word of God still abides today. <laughs> Heaven and earth. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will stand forever and ever. And then it is a perceiving word. Notice this in verse 13. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest or laid bare or displayed or shown openly in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Now, that word open in here is an interesting, interesting word. But all things are opened. It is the word where we get our word trachea. Do you know that sometimes in an emergency situation, a tracheotomy has to be performed in order to open up the breathing passages of a person's body. It opens it up so that the air can get in. You understand, that is exactly what the Word of God does. It opens us up and really reveals the inside of us. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't like those airport scanners. Do y'all go through security any? And, and I don't like standing there in, in, a, in a, this you swallow a penny and, and the alarm goes off. That's just the way it is. Uh, but, but what it does, it just, it's, it's so revealing. It reveals everything. Uh, there ought to be a spiritualometer that, that we walk through when we come into the house of God. I'm getting ready to buy one of these and put it at the front door. That, that reveals the sin and the inconsistencies of our life and buzzes and alarms goes off and says, get rid of that sin, get rid of that inconsistency and then walk through again somewhere. You know, we have one already. We have a spiritualometer. It's the Word of God. I came across this somewhere. I know that it's part of the Gideons, but I don't know who came up with it, who wrote it. The Bible contains the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy, its precepts are binding, its histories are true, and its decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, and practice it to be holy. 
It contains light to direct you, food to support you, and comfort to cheer you. It's the traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's charter. Here too, heaven is opened and the gates of hell disclosed. Christ is its grand subject, our good is its design, and the glory of God its end. It should fill the memory, rule the heart, and guide the feet. Read it slowly, frequently, and prayerfully. It is a mine of wealth, a paradise of glory, and a river of pleasure. It is given you in life, will be opened at the judgment, and be remembered forever. It involves the highest responsibility, rewards the greatest labor, and will condemn all who trifle with its sacred contents. You understand, the word of God is adequate. Trust it, read it, believe it, abide in it, dwell, let the word of God dwell in you richly, and you will come into the fullness of God. You will experience your Canaan. Now let me move on from number one to give you number two. You ready? I want to talk to you not only about the ministry of the Word of God, I want to talk to you about the ministry of the high priest. Now, get used to this because the high priest is going to be a subject that we're going to be looking at through chapter number 7. You say, oh my, my, that's going to be boring. No, it's not. It's really going to be exhilarating to you. So hang in here with us during uh, this study. Now, I've told you twice already in our study in that Old Testament priest who went in to the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement, he carried a sacrifice for his sins and for the sins of the people, offered it up there unto God one day a year. To forgive the sins? No, but to roll them forward for another year. That was the Old Testament high priest. But here in this passage, you're seeing a terminology that was never applied to the Old Testament high priest. The Bible says we have a, notice, great high priest. A great high priest. And his name is Jesus. The Bible says that he passed through the heavens. He's talking about the ascension when he went through layer after layer after layer of the clouds and went on in to heaven itself and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Oftentimes, you have referred to Jesus in three ways. You have referred to him as prophet and priest and king. Now, when he was here on this earth, those 33 years, Jesus was a prophet. That word means that he preached and that he taught the word of God with us. As the role of a prophet, that's what he would do, preach and that he would teach. One of these days, the trumpet is going to sound and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. That is going to be the rapture of the church. The next seven years, there will be chaos uh, on the earth. Will be seven years of tribulation. After that seven year period, Jesus is going to return the second time and set up his earthly reign of a thousand years where he will be in display and ruling in a fashion as king as never before. He was a prophet. He is going to be the king. Right now, he is our high priest. And he is functioning in the role of a high priest. He is seated at the right hand of the throne of God and he is keeping us secure. And he's in that role going to bring us all the way through the exigencies of this life. He is there in glory to bear affinity with your life. He is there because he understands every struggle that you are facing in your life right now. He's there to secure you. He is there to forgive you. He's there to comfort you. He's there to cheer you. He's there to bring you 
into the fullness in your relationship with the Heavenly Father. The scripture says, let us hold fast to our profession. Now notice what he did not say in that verse. He did not say, let's hold fast to salvation. He said, let's hold fast to our profession. There's so many people, and there, there may be some of you, and I'm not picking on anybody here today. It just happens all the time, and it may have been that some of you here have done this. You've come to me. I've, I'll say to you, how you doing? How you doing? How's things going? Well, preacher, you know, I'm in a major battle here, but I'm holding on. I'm holding on. You know what I respond to? Well, quit holding on. Let go. Let go. Why? Because the Lord says that we are in the palm of his hand and nothing can ever take us out of the palm of his hand. Now we may go, we may go from knuckle to knuckle to knuckle, but glory to God, we are not going to fall out. He has us right here. I remember working at Sears a number of years ago. Uh, before I went into ministry, that's how I made my living. And Allstate Insurance Company had uh, their offices there right in the middle of Sears in downtown Greenville. And, and their slogan was, you're in good hands with Allstate. Do you, how many of you remember that slogan? Do you remember that? You're in good hands with Allstate. Well, <laughs> you miss one premium and see how good you are in those hands. <laughs> huh? But, but aren't you glad that you can miss a payment with God, but God's not going to let you go. He's got you in the palm of his hands. Once you've placed your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, you're in good hands. That doesn't mean that you can go about and sin any time that you want to and you can just sin at your bidding. But I want to tell you, it does point to the fact that Jesus is your high priest. All right, look at verse 15. It's a very, very precious verse. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. You know, as pastor, uh, I realize and I know that a lot of you are facing some major struggles in your life right now. Some of you are facing some very difficult challenges physically. Some of you have some family issues that are going on that you're just scratching your head wondering, where did I go wrong? How did I fail? What happened here? Some of you struggling financially. You're wondering, how in the world am I going to get out of this? How am I going to make it another day? Can I just say a word to you from the word? There's not a struggle that you're going to go through. There's not a temptation that you'll face that the Lord Jesus is not able to say, I've been there. I know how you feel. And because of that, he's able to give you what you need. No temptation that he hasn't been tempted. You say, was he tempted to sin? Well, not tempted to make him sin, but tempted to show that he was sinless. Now, one of our good deacons, he's here this morning. He's going to be serving the Lord's Supper. You need to be praying for him. Uh, that, that boy's not right with God. He called me one night this week. I was preaching down in Rockingham and he said, are you home? And I said, no, I've got about an hour and 15, 20 minutes and I'll be home. He said, uh, could you come by my house? And I said, yeah, I come by your house. He said, I got something for you. I said, okay. So I drove by his house. He comes with this huge smile on his face out in the yard. And he's got one of those 22 layered chocolate cakes. <laughs> Now, if y'all know, I've been really trying. I've been struggling, but I've been, I've been working good at it. I've been a I've been good boy, and I have. 22 layers of my favorite cake in the world. I looked up to the Lord. I said, Lord, you were never tempted with this right here. I can assure you of that. <laughs> and 
And I may as well go ahead and confess, I failed miserably. <laughs> Look at verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Did you know ancient kings, biblical kings, were really unapproachable. You, you, couldn't, you couldn't get into their presence. As a matter of fact, it was a death sentence for you to initiate any contact with the king. Hmm? Matter of fact, in that day, um, a wife couldn't even approach her husband unless he gave her permission to approach him. Give me that old time religion. No, 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 I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. Honey, I'm sorry. I, I promise you. I know you're watching. I'm sorry. But, but, but here's the deal. Unless the king held up a golden scepter, uh, which was indicative that, yes, I will entertain listening to you, you couldn't get it. Mordecai went to Esther and said to Esther, Esther, I want you to go to the king and, and I want you to intercede on behalf of the Jews because they're going to be killed mercilessly if, if we don't do something. And the king has the power to stop that. And Esther, I want you to go see the king. She said, I'll die. Nevertheless, she went to the king. And the Bible says that he showed her grace and he showed her mercy on behalf of the nation of Israel. Do you see what God is saying here in this wonderful passage we can approach, our God is approachable. And he says, let's approach him with great confidence. Let's go boldly into his presence because it is there that we will find grace, that which we don't deserve, and we will find mercy withholding from us what we do deserve when we go into his presence. Oh, friends, I, I know how the enemy works. I know that he puts in your mind that you've got all of this garbage, you've got all of this sin, you've got all of this disobedience, and, and God could never, ever forgive you for what you have done in your life. May I say to you, God has more grace than you will ever have sin. God will dispense more mercy than you can ever believe him for. You will find grace and mercy. That which we don't deserve. We, we don't deserve anything but hell and judgment. But God saves us and redeems us and washes us and purges us and cleanses us from all of our sin. Have you received his grace? Has God extended his mercy to you? Oh, if not, friend, God is able even today to take his blood and wash all your sin away. Would you bow with me and let's pray together. Father, thank you for this precious time that we have had here together with you around your word. Thank you that you have penetrated our minds and our hearts. And God, you have exposed us. You have revealed us and all of our sin and all of our inconsistencies and all of our disobedience. Oh, Holy Spirit, I pray that today, while it is fresh with us, God, may we seek your forgiveness. Lord, may we repent right now and turn away from those things that have been so displeasing unto you. And God, would you restore us to a right relationship with you. Lord, before we ever participate in this Lord's Supper, may our minds and our hearts and our lives reflect the cleansing that only you can provide. 
Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.